Today we're going to look at the life and times of author Stephen Crane. One of the things he wrote was, a man said to the universe, sir, I exist. However, replied the universe, the fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. So when we take a look at Crane, unfortunately he died at the age of 28. Even though he was a brilliant writer, he was a prolific writer, he did not live that long. Now two great books from him would be Maggie, A Girl of the Streets and The Red Badge of Courage. But he's also put out impressive poems and over 90 pieces of short fiction, which include The Blue Hotel uh, and specifically The Open Boat, which a lot of critics at the time called a masterpiece. He also, when he takes a look at Maggie, a girl of the streets, and a lot of his short fiction, his depiction of ghetto life and the deprivation of war are very prominent. Now, true to naturalism, Crane shows his characters trapped in situations that they just cannot control. Still, these characters show courage and valor in the face of just insurmountable adversities. And so here are a few of his most famous works. We do see, starting in 1893, Maggie, a girl of the streets, which is going to show uh, the uh, deprivation uh, out on the streets. Uh, the Red Badge of Courage in 1895 was a fictionalized uh, account of the Battle of Chancellorsville from the American Civil War. Uh, we have the Black Writers, and then we have the Black Writers in other lines where he's working on his poetry. And then we start seeing some more of his short stories. George's Mother, The Third Violet, uh, specifically in 1898, his masterpiece, The Open Boat, and his other tales of adventure, and then his last pieces of work, which are poetry, uh, one of the most famous known as War is Kind in 1900. So when we take a look at The Open Boat, it's a fictionalized account of a very traumatic personal experience that Stephen Crane actually lived through. Now, a ship on which he was a passenger sank off the coast of Florida, and he found himself as one of the four men in a tiny open dinghy, struggling to make it through a narrow strip of rough sea and pounding surf that separated them from dry land. So then we take a look at the sense of naturalism and at the time period that, that Crane was writing in. Uh, as it was with the open boat, the men were forced to remain for 30 hours in the boat, rowing frantically against the tide and bailing constantly to keep the craft afloat in the treacherous water before they were able to come ashore at Daytona Beach. Now, we could expect that the story be written as a heart-pounding adventure tale, but we have to again remember he's writing in the naturalist or the realist movement in the late 1800s. So it's very cerebral in its approach. It focuses less on the adrenaline rush of danger than on the philosophical question of man's relationship to the world of nature. How is he going to survive when nature just keeps pounding back at him and overwhelms him? So as Crane shows in this story, the protagonist's salvation is dependent upon whether or not he'll adapt to his surroundings and help his fellow man during this time of nature, and not whether or not he can actually conquer nature itself. Now, as he demonstrates, this is a moot point because it's impossible to conquer nature. It's too big, it's too impersonal, and man is just a speck against its awesome powers. So the best one can do is learn nature's way and work with and not against them. So when we continue on looking at the open boat, the sense of complete absorption in the struggle against nature is illustrated by the very first line of the story. None of them knew the color of the sky. The reason for this is soon made obvious. The imperiled survivors cannot take their eyes off the waves because letting their guard down for a moment would mean certain death. One large wave is going to up, up end the entire boat and then they'd be out of their boat. Now significantly, Crane does not deal with the question of heroism. The men in the boat don't feel heroic, nor do they ask us to think of them in those terms. They're simply doing what they need in order to survive and how to help one another survive as well. Interestingly, however, this does not make Crane's story realistic. It actually creates a kind of hyper-realism, this vivid, nightmarish state in which the waves resemble horses scrambling over walls of water and carpets on a line in a gale and white flames, just to mention a few of the dozens of metaphors that he has. I mean, he could have just presented the facts. He lived through it. This is what it felt like. But Crane, being a writer, decides to give us this nightmare state by just throwing metaphors at us. And the homeliness of these images does not make Crane's rendering of the experience any less profound. 
They simply call attention to the inability of the mere words to convey the life or death experiences he was having with nature. They also accentuate the gulf between an objective journalistic rendering of going down with the ship and the only way to convey the full horror of the experience. So when Crane starts going through the fierce and startling imagery, it almost sounds like a gothic romantic tale. It does start sounding a little more like an adventure tale like Poe might have written. But in no other respect is the story romanticized. On the contrary, the threat of death is not sensationalized because it doesn't need to be. The usage of such extreme imagery makes it very terrifyingly real. And in addition to the vivid language, Crane also uses carefully chosen anecdotes to make the situation seem harrowing. Now, to the extent to which these men are poised on the brink of life and death is illustrated by the seagull that lands on the captain's head. Now, as Crane says, the captain naturally wished to knock it away with the end of the heavy painter, but he didn't dare do it because anything resembling an emphatic gesture would have capsized the freighted boat. And so with his open hand, the captain gently and carefully waved the gull away. Now, obviously, to remain in this state for 30 hours, it seems almost incomprehensible. It's a bird. Shoo it away. Get rid of it. But we have to remember this is a very unsteady boat. So every little movement, every little thought, every little expression, every anecdote that is going on in the boat is very profound. Crane also has this remarkable use of rhythm in the story because you have to remember he's constantly working with the motion of the sea. While each phrase has a distinct sense of rising and falling, and each one is also a different length, just like the waves, some are huge and rolling phrases, while others are merely little swells. One can feel a huge roll of the water in the line, the craft pranced and reared and plunged like an animal. As each wave came and she rose for it, she seemed like a horse making at a fence outrageously high. Now, in his imagery and in his rhythm, Crane never allows us to forget the story's setting even for a second. The huge and harrowing presence of nature, poised to destroy the insignificance which is man, commands our attention at all times. So in spite of the fact he's using great imagery and rhythm, being a poet of his own rights, we're still put in the sense of this hyper-realism. And then, of course, we have to remember what the story is about. Consider this passage where Crane describes the time when we were swamped by the surf and making the best of our way toward the shore. But finally, the correspondent, that is your author, arrived at a place in the sea where travel was beset with difficulty. He did not pause swimming to inquire what manner of current had caught him, but there his progress ceased. The shore was set before him like a bit of scenery on a stage, and he looked at it and understood with his eyes each detail of it. Now as the cook passed much farther to the left, the captain was calling to him. Turn over on your back, cook. Turn over on your back and use the oar. All right, sir. The cook turned on his back and, paddling with an oar, went ahead as if he were a canoe. So what is the major theme we have here? Well, obviously the fighting of man between nature. Now there's no fighting the sea. It can't be conquered. Nature can't be conquered. But one can learn to bob along on its surface and aid to the best of one's ability those fellow human beings who are also caught in the grip of nature's immense indifference. All right, that is The Open Boat in particular with Stephen Crane. If you guys want me to go through some more of The Open Boats or maybe perhaps more of Stephen Crane's uh, stories, or if you'd like to learn about other authors, please leave me a comment. If you liked what you saw here, please like and consider subscribing. Thanks for stopping by.